Hello, my name is Steven. Welcome to HiFinder Tech Talks. Today, we are going to be talking about turbo compressors and with that is the person here who has a PhD from arguably Switzerland's most uh, renowned uh, technical institution. He currently works at Celeriton, that's the ETH, actually what I meant. He currently works at uh, Celeriton, uh, where he's heading up the R&D for fuel cell applications, essentially. Welcome, Markus. Markus Brandstetter. Hello, Stephen. Thank you for having me. It's great to be on your show. Thank you, Marcus. Um, yeah, you are connected to us by video link and uh, you are in a special place. Can you tell us a little bit where you are, please? Yes, I'm currently in one of our main uh, working session rooms uh, right next to uh, the entire research and development department uh, of our company, where all the concepts or the new concepts that we develop are uh, being brainstormed or uh, are being presented. Okay, wonderful. So that means just next to all the R&D guys, I know you head up the team, uh, but the good news is in case we run into any serious technical question here, you could quickly probably hop over to your colleagues there, right? Exactly. <laughs> then I can grab my, my specialists uh, and uh, take them in. Super. Okay, so perfect. Let's go right into the topic. Marcus, what is a turbo compressor? Uh, actually, I, for, for that matter, I, I brought a, a slide with me or a, an image that I could show you to, a little, to give you a little bit of an overview mm -hmm. of how such a turbo compressor looks like and how it functions. Okay, yes, we see it. So you can see it. All right, great. So on the left-hand side, you can see a, a simplified schematic uh, overview of uh, how such a turbo compressor um, is built. Mm -hmm. um, so fundamentally, it consists of three, or in the, in the simple form, it uh, consists of three parts, which is the impeller, so the, 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 the wheel that works on the fluid, yes. um, the diffuser, which is followed by, uh, by uh, our impeller, and after the diffuser, we have a, a so-called volute or spiral casing, which connects uh, the compressor to um, uh, the fuel cell stack, for instance. So the impeller so, is that um, number two on that uh, on that picture. Number two, uh, and that's what yes. spins. So impeller around. is uh, is uh, you can see it right here. Yes. The fuel is number four, and uh, the spiral casing is essentially number six. Understood. Understood. Exactly. So maybe and now we can uh, briefly go through step by step. Yes. Uh, what happens like from a, from a fluid perspective? Um, so at inlet, which is now indicated by number one. Um, going essentially direct, the flow is directed towards the eye of the impeller. One is talking about the eye, which is the center of this impeller. Um, the high rotational speed. Um, impeller is rotating. We have a so-called flow passage, which, which is generated um, by the blades uh, of such an impeller. Yep. Um, where we have essentially an increase um, in uh, or a change in angular momentum of the flow and a change uh, of uh, total, total pressure. So across um, this flow passage, which is created by, um, by the spiral casing, which is the outer contour and the impeller, uh, around 60% of the total pressure increase is taking place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as that spins, that, 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 that increases the pressure going out, okay? Correct, mm -hmm. correct. So it's essentially, first of all, it, it changes the angular momentum and it increases the total pressure. Okay. What is interesting to note, uh, after, for instance, the uh, edge of, these, uh, of this impeller, we have uh, still uh, flow velocities of around 200 meters a second, um, oh. which means uh, we need to still decelerate uh, this, this flow yeah. uh, to further increase the static pressure that is required for certain applications. This is done um, by the so-called diffuser, where we increase the volume, thereby increasing the static pressure. Um, after the diffuser, um, we have, as I said, the so-called uh, spiral casing or a volute, where we further reduce the radial velocity and collect the flow towards the end application, which could, for instance, be a fuel cell stack. Yeah. Um, and maybe on the right-hand side, you can see one of our more, more recent uh, designs that, uh, that uh, we have already presented at numerous fairs, um, where we can see actually how it looks in real life, mm -hmm. which is a cut through um, of, a, of our one, one of our CAT designs. Um, so maybe I can also show you um, how typically um, such a, uh, like 
what is the variation of such uh, impeller designs, mm -hmm. which is, from my perspective, very interesting to, to see. As you can see, there's a huge variety of uh, so-called mixed flow designs, where we have uh, also a radial component, or the classical design, which one would see in, uh, in fuel cell uh, stack applications. So, so what, what is the difference uh, between you know, one that let, let's speak, n narrows up and the one that's completely, what, what's the main difference? So the main difference is, um, is directly, it's a very technical uh, question, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. The difference is uh, directed to the flow coefficient. Mm -hmm. So essentially the throughput that uh, such a compressor needs to, needs to, needs to be able to, to, uh, to be designed for. For instance, once we go towards axial flow designs, uh, which is a classic for, for gas turbine designs, for instance, yes. they have high mass flows requirements. Whereas when we go to really radial designs, which is, this is, for instance, a purely radial design, 2D even, we have very low mass flows. All ah, right. Okay. So the mass flow essentially makes a difference. Okay. Correct. Well, so you have already mentioned some, uh, some applications. Where do we typically find turbo compressors in the hydrogen economy? Yes. I mean, there, there, uh, there are three main applications, actually. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, actually, for that purpose, I also brought you another image that I could show you, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very simplified schematic of a proton exchange membrane fuel cell, um, so a piping diagram, essentially, where we can see um, air inlets. And here we have our air compressor, there which is, is one of is. the main application areas uh, for these turbo compressors, mm -hmm. compressing the air, uh, generating for the cathode side to, to produce the air or uh, eventually the, the oxygen that is required by uh, these fuel cell stacks. Oh yeah. So we see that it, 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 it pushes it pushes the air into the humidifier and then into the system, and it needs Correct. also cooling, as uh, as I see it from that um, from that Correct. diagram. So I, I know you are an expert in this. So can you take us a little bit more deeply into the actual unit? So we saw uh, the first yes. picture, but uh, please show us a little bit more about the components of it, please. Mark. Yes. So let me briefly one uh, one more point uh, yes. to to clarify. So, I mean, two compressors can be used on the cathode side, uh -huh. but in addition also on, on the anode side. So, for instance, for a hydrogen recirculation dedicated for these designs or for electrolyzer hydrogen recirculation. Uh -huh. but, so, for, so, you also could use a turbo compressor for recirculating the hydrogen on, absolutely. on the... Okay. Absolutely. And also for in electrolyzer... Dedicated okay. designs, though. Yes. But um, my, my business unit is really focusing on the air paths on the cathode side, but generally speaking, turbo compressors can also be used uh, for hydrogen recirculation. Purposes. Understood, understood, understood. So back to the original question of, yes. of yours. Uh, I'll jump into the, to the more details uh, of uh, how such a compressor system looks like. And yeah. What I brought here is actually a cut through of uh, one of our, of our compressor systems. So first I'm gonna zoom out a bit. Yes. Uh, for, in the beginning, I only talked about the aerodynamics, um, which is only a, a portion. Obviously, it's an important part, but it's only a portion of uh, what the compressor system um, is uh, consisting of. So on the left-hand side, we can see the compressor. And on the right-hand side, we can, can see the converter. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe let's go from uh, left to right. Um, so I already explained to you the impeller, the aerodynamics. Which, and the impeller is usually connected to a rotor, mm -hmm. which uh, rotates at a high rotational speed. The rotor itself is suspended by so-called gas bearings, which uh, makes this entire thing uh, special. Mm -hmm. Why does it make it special? Because uh, it's generating compressed air, which is oil-free and particle-free, mm -hmm. um, and virtually nowhere. That's uh, the second bit. Then obviously the torque needs to be generated to compress this air, right? Uh, and the torque yeah, is generated by an electric motor. In this particular case, uh, we can see it. It's, uh, it's uh, mounted around uh, or in between the two radial bearings, um, which is our state winding. And in the middle, we have our magnet or so permanent magnet arrangement. Yes. So we are talking usually. We are talking about permanent magnet synchronous machines that we use here which are especially designed for high rotational speeds, which uh, where we have to take into account uh, a couple of uh, intricate things uh, in the design process. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
Yes. Uh, so, so Sorry. actually, you mentioned high rotational speed. So I'm, I'm, I'm just you know trying to imagine being at the impeller. So that gets up to a very high RPM stage, and you also yes. mentioned some really uh, fast uh, speeds there. I mean, doesn't yes. this, you know, don't you reach uh, the sound barrier there and things like that? Don't you get into other kind of physical problems because of yeah, that? Yeah. So, uh, so maybe give you a, so to give you a couple of values here. Uh, which might be interesting for the for the view as well. Uh, so we range between uh, rotational speeds of uh, so for the larger compressors around 120 kilo RPM, so 120,000 RPM, up to 300,000 RPM for the smaller systems. Uh -huh. uh, usually, <laughs> um, which means uh, when we when we convert that into uh, into velocities, we're talking about three to 400 meters a second. Wow. Um, yeah. So. Um, Generally speaking, um, sound barrier is something we try to avoid um, because uh, supersonic operation always results in shocks. Yeah. So compressibility effects, shocks always are, are associated with irreversible processes and ultimately also in a reduction in efficiency. Okay, understood. So that's, uh, we are trying not to operate in the supersonic okay. regime. And, and I see there was cooling, I saw from diagram. So what is actually being cooled is the electric motor. That, that's what's being cooled, so not... Uh, so obviously within, um, within that system, yeah. we have a couple of, uh, of uh, sources for losses. Yes. Uh, one is, for instance, the gas burns to generate losses. Yes. Um, but mainly it is the electric motor, as you indicated. Yeah, yes. okay. and Where so, we either can cool it with water, yes. or with a cooling medium, or um, it is air-cooled. Yes. Okay. I'm very uh, curious about the gas bearings, Marcus. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that because I know you also have a bit of a specialty around that. Firstly, yes. I want to ask, how does it work? And also, I mean, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a compressor, it actually has one chamber where there's air. So is that also, isn't that an interaction with the actual medium that is being pumped? Um, so we have the same medium in there, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I have to briefly have to check whether I have a, a slide that I could show you. Mm -hmm. um, yes, here we go. So uh, let's dive into the, the, the details of gas bearings. I mean, yes. gas bearings are, are very interesting. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, uh, one can differentiate between hydrostatic and hydrodynamic bearings uh, for mobility applications, uh, which is uh, the most uh, most current case. For instance, for road applications or um, or uh, aerospace applications. Um, hydrodynamic bearings is the usually is the, the one that one uses. The mm -hmm. uh, reason being simplified design, few external uh, parts, and so on. Yeah. How does it work? Um, one has essentially a shaft, and then we have, one has a bushing, and through rotation, one generates a pressure um, through the rotation within, within the, the small uh, gaps uh, between the journal and the bushing. Mm -hmm. um, which generates uh, a cushion where the, the, the journal floats on, on top. That's essentially how it works, so, fundamentally. So by, by spinning the fluid around or in, in, in the gap of these two, you create a cushion that is strong Correct. enough for that to carry. Okay. Correct, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I can maybe briefly show you, I mean, there are different types of gas bearings yes. one could, for instance, use. Um, the, the simplest one one can think of is a plane bearing, where essentially just a cylinder and a, and a bushing, which is a which is a pipe, so to speak. Uh, and just by rotation and the coet flow, one generates a cushion where the road starts floating. Strongly and a narrow uh, regime where one can operate these these bearings. And for instance, the, the technology that we uh, mostly use is uh, is herringbone grooved bearings, where we can uh, engrave um, structures. Yeah. Uh, to increase the regime where these uh, systems can operate. Okay. And and when you have this kind of thing, like I said, if if, if it's if it's you know if it's a, if it has a pressure chamber on one side where it's spinning essentially, do you see any mm -hmm. effect of the air? In this case, you're you're moving air, but do you see any effect of that in the bearing when the pressure rises in the in the spinning? Um, no, not particularly. No. There is no there is no direct interaction. Oh, there is no. Okay. Okay, yeah, and and so essentially this 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 floats then and um, just using the opportunity here, 
what happens when like you know the compressor shakes or gets shocks and so on you know because i mean obviously if it's a physical bearing let me just call it that you know a ball bearing or so everyone knows okay there is something but here now we are floating on a cushion how does that how does that work yeah one is uh when actually when i talk to other engineers it's always surprising to them that uh, these uh, gas bearing type of bearing i mean i can briefly show you another image mm -hmm. Um, they actually have stiffnesses which are comparable to ball bearings, which is, uh, for some people, very surprising. Which means, um, how does it work? So by rotation, we have this gas film where the journal is floating. And uh, once we have a vibration shock, so it's essentially displacement, um, on one side, we decrease the gap yes. um, of, this, of, of this gas film, which increases the stiffness um, of, of the gas film thereby exerting a force on the journal in the uh, opposite direction, which means there is always a force acting into the centering of the journal uh, when we have an external force acting and it's such as vibration or shock. Here on the right-hand side, uh, you can see actually one of our compressors being uh, tested on a vibrational bench uh, where we, for instance, test the systems up to 20 G um, under uh, real conditions. Uh -huh. So, yeah. okay, so this is, okay, clearly the shock perspective, okay, that's very, very interesting. That is that kind of, um, you know, resistance. What about load bearing? <laughs> Sorry if I ask, but like, you know, so what if, if it's a very heavy shaft or something? Are these air bearings fine for that as well? Absolutely. I mean, you have to, obviously you need to design for it, yes? Yes, yes. Um, the, the size uh, increases and the... the, 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 the there needs to be obviously uh, attention to how you design such a bearing, but uh, in terms of forces, um, uh, you can definitely design also for larger shafts. Mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, here we tested up to 20 G yes. uh, acceleration, which means um, the forces of this rotor uh, under acceleration is, uh, is quite large. Okay, and, and, and uh, last question for the air bearings. What, what, what speed does it have to have to actually start working? You know, because I was just going through my head like, ah, it could be used in other application modes. It does need to have a certain speed, right, before it starts working. Yes, I can briefly yeah. elaborate on that as well. And yes. I actually, um, that's a very common question, which is why I, I also brought uh, an image that I could show. Oh, wow. <laughs> Typically speaking, uh, when we look at, uh, at, at curves, um, when we actually accelerate and increase the speed of such uh, gas bearing type um, uh, bearings, we have a mixed regime where essentially um, the road is still not yet floating. Mm -hmm. And we have a certain liftoff speed, which is uh, at a very low uh, rotational speed compared to the maximum. Yes. Um, and after that, essentially the road floats uh -huh. and has virtually no, uh, no contact anymore. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, no contact. That sounds like easy maintenance and, and these kind of things. Which brings me to another question, uh, Markus. I know that... Uh, the compressors are often like maybe say one of the cost drivers in the whole, especially fuel cell systems. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Like why or what is it that's so expensive on, on, a, on a turbo compressor like this? So fun. Maybe uh, I can give you a little bit of an insight into mm -hmm. um, um, how, how much um, value is also um, given by, by such a compressor. And, uh, let me briefly show you one of the, one of the images here. So from, for an entire fuel cell system, the component share value for the air compressor is up to 20% when mm -hmm. we talk about the entire fuel cell system, which also, uh, and, it, and furthermore, uh, not only the value that is created by the compressor, but also um, the, the power consumption is also 10 to 20% of the entire system, which um, also is a, a strong argument why um, these uh, compressor systems are worth uh, to further develop and, 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 and improve, which is why one they're uh, a substantial part of the fuel cell system, which is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so that means you guys are working on getting them even better, hopefully bringing down the cost as well. Can, can you give us a bit of an outlook on what you're working on? Yes, I mean, there, is a, there are a couple of things uh, in the market and in the development uh, what is what is happening these days? One thing is obviously that the market is moving to larger and larger stack size. For instance, that's one of the development yeah. paths in the industry and in the market. The second bit is, for instance, a continuous integration of, for instance, electronics and yes. compressors, a decreasing 
uh, downsizing of everything to uh, to uh, to save space. And I think the the last uh, important bit is industrialization. So uh, further uh, being able to produce uh, in in a process stable and uh, cost efficient manner products for the hydrogen market. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of work still for you to do and the guys around you. I know that uh, in the area of industrialization, Celeroton has actually, I've personally seen you move from generation to generation, you know, integrating more stuff into one unit and, and making it even easier to fit in. So, so good on you. And uh, also good on you for sharing the time and your knowledge during the session. We've unfortunately already reached uh, the end of the time that we have. Marcus, but I guess this was very insightful. So thank you. And um, not only thank you to you, but thank you to the viewers for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please drop us a line or subscribe to the channel here. I can tell you that when you go on highfinder.com, you can find many components just like this one that we've talked about. So you can get into contact with people like Marcus or all his colleagues at uh, Celeriton. It would be a pleasure to have you there. Please enjoy working on stuff that makes the hydrogen economy and everything else work. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in another video. Thank you again, Marcus. And thank, thank you for you watching. Thank you, Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. It was good to see you.